metabolic health. And we're hearing the term metabolic health so, so much more these days, thank goodness, because we're realizing that metabolism and our metabolic health is really one of these links and these connectors between so many of the different symptoms and diseases we're seeing today. What can our blood sugar actually tell us about our metabolic health? Mm. Blood sugar is an incredible biomarker because it's a readout of so many different aspects of our health. Mm. Of course, food impacts blood sugar. When you eat a food with carbohydrates, it gets broken down, goes into the bloodstream, and we're going to see that as a rise in blood sugar. But what a lot of people might not realize is that other things can cause an increase in blood sugar, like if we're stressed. Stress alone can cause cortisol to be released in the body, and that cortisol goes to the liver and actually tells our blood sugar to raise. And the purpose of that is to provide energy for our body to mount a response to whatever that stress signal is. So stress can raise our blood sugar. Exercise, of course, has a profound impact on our blood sugar because muscles, when we use them, that's a glucose sink. It takes glucose out of the bloodstream. Um, sleep also has a profound impact on blood sugar. When we don't get enough sleep, our glucose can be more erratic and can be more up and down and more spiky. Our microbiome has a profound impact on our blood sugar. And people with different um, patterns of microbial composition in their gut actually respond to different foods differently in terms of how much their blood sugar raises. So it's really this incredible um, readout in our bloodstream of so many different variables in our uh, in our diet and lifestyle. And so, um, you know, big picture, what it does is show us what's kind of going on with our metabolic health. And we're hearing the term metabolic health so, so much more these days, thank goodness, because we're realizing that metabolism and our metabolic health is really one of these links and these connectors between so many of the different symptoms and diseases we're seeing today. Blood sugar is actually related to nine of the 10 leading causes of death in America right now. If you go to the CDC website and you type in leading causes of death, you will see 10 different conditions. And nine of the 10 of them are either directly caused by elevated um, or dysfunctional blood sugar or are worsened or accelerated by dysfunctional blood sugar. So you're gonna think, see things like, of course, type two diabetes, which clearly is linked to blood sugar, but also things like cancer, and Alzheimer's dementia. Alzheimer's dementia is now being called type three diabetes because it's so linked to blood sugar. You're gonna see heart disease, which is directly linked to blood sugar. Um, but you're also gonna see things like um, respiratory infections. We know that respiratory infections, even things like influenza, these the mortality and morbidity in these conditions are much worse in people with unstable blood sugar. So blood sugar really is something that all of us need to um, be aware of what's going on inside our own bodies um, in terms of where our blood sugar stands. And I know you've talked about this on your show before, but right now, 128 million Americans, that's almost 50% of the country, have type 2 diabetes or prediabetes. So clinical dysregulation of blood sugar. If you're an American adult, you're just on a trajectory uh, towards, towards getting a blood sugar problem. And the vast majority of these cases are totally preventable. And they are so linked to increased morbidity and mortality from chronic disease. And, and so this is just really low hanging fruit of this biomarker that we can track and manage to set ourselves up for current wellness, current performance, but also avoidance in chronic disease and increased longevity. It's so powerful. That number is baffling. We're talking, we're knocking on the door of about 50% of our society having type 2 diabetes or pre-diabetes. We're very, very close. And again, if we just use our basic awareness and look out at the world, we can see that we're not in a good place. And as you mentioned, I love that you brought this in here, that the leading cause of death, this is one of those things that if we're paying attention to helping to, to normalize or optimize our blood sugar, it's going to help to reduce the things that are really taking us out. Another one that's and I had to look this up recently, but as of this recording, liver disease mm. is number 11. So it's it's knocking on the door again as jumping into that top 10 causes of death. And our liver is massively important in this grand scheme of things with our blood sugar as well. So let's talk a little bit about how the liver plays into this. 
The liver could not be more important when we think about blood sugar. This is really the one of the key organs in our body that helps us manage our metabolism, that helps us process energy in the body. It's an organ we don't think about all the time. I don't think we're all walking around thinking about our liver, but it's one that we should. We should be thinking about our liver health really every single day. And one of the key things here is actually uh, not just glucose, but it's fructose. So fructose is um, something that we are getting way too much of in our culture. And if you think about table sugar and the sugar that's added to most processed foods, it's sucrose. And sucrose is half glucose, half fructose. So we're getting this huge glucose and fructose load whenever we're really eating processed foods that have added sugar. And I believe that 70% of processed foods have some added sugar in them. So that's a ton of glucose um, and fructose. And what fructose does is it goes straight to the liver and as it's broken down, it actually creates a byproduct called uric acid. So fructose gets broken down, creates uric acid. And that uric acid in the liver actually goes into the mitochondria, which are the little energy producing factories of the cell. Um, and it causes oxidative stress. It causes this damage to the mitochondria that makes our mitochondria less effective at doing what they're supposed to do, which is producing energy. It creates cellular dysfunction in the liver. And so instead of actually processing glucose effectively, the mitochondria, when they're dysfunctional, will turn glucose to fat. So then we get fat buildup in our liver cells and we get fatty liver disease, which is now affecting over 30% of American adults. It's this silent epidemic that's happening where our livers are essentially um, becoming dysfunctional because of this huge amount of fructose that we're eating, therefore causing oxidative stress in our mitochondria, poor glucose management, shunting glucose to fat, creating organ dysfunction. And then what happens is our liver becomes insulin resistant. That fatty liver disease causes insulin resistance in the liver. So now you've got this organ that essentially is resistant to this hormone insulin. And for I think probably most of your listeners are very familiar with what insulin does, but when glucose goes into the body, insulin rises to help glucose be taken out of the bloodstream, shuttled into the cells for use. So if the liver is more insulin resistant because of what's happening with fructose, your body's having to produce, push out more insulin to get the same amount of glucose into the cells. So now you've got um, basically dysfunction in taking glucose out of the bloodstream and into the cells because of that insulin resistance. So because of table sugar, because of sucrose, because of this massive amount of sugar that we're eating in our diets these days, we're creating liver dysfunction, which is then causing and worsening glucose dysfunction all through this web of insulin resistance. Um, and you'll see many different stats out there about how much refined sugar we're eating per year, but some will say we're eating about depending on the study and how you're measuring it, somewhere between like 60 and 152 pounds of added sugar per year on our diet. Probably 100, 200 years ago, you were eating less than maybe a pound per year. It just wasn't accessible. But now because, you know, our, our government literally subsidizes the production of high fructose corn syrup and, yeah. and, and sugar, um, <laughs> which is just, that's a whole nother conversation. But, um, we are eating so much of it. It's cheap, it's accessible, it's everywhere, it's in all our packaged foods. Um, and so we are just, our bodies are overwhelmed with this substrate and it's leading to cellular dysfunction that's setting us up for insulin resistance and glucose dysregulation. And the best thing we can you know, possibly do, uh, I think for our health to just have a wide variety of benefits is to reduce that added sugar consumption absolutely yeah and you just said it's added sugar we're not even talking about the naturally occurring sugar that's in the foodstuffs as well you know it's nuts to to think about it and this has consequences you know and i'm a big proponent of us just looking at the results like let's actually look and see are we doing okay as a society and you know i love how you articulated with the liver and i want everybody you might want to even rewind that back and listen again with this interaction with the liver and our blood in our in our blood sugar because our liver, and I've said this before, this little, uh, this little kind of a parody or, or or beauty with the liver. If the name itself, live, is in the name, mm. liver. Without your your liver, you're it's a wrap. Like your liver and your brain are like at at the very top of the list. But our liver doesn't really get a lot of respect. And you know, and it's such a regenerative and forgiving organ as well. And so you mentioned fatty liver disease, but specifically we're talking non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. We knew about the devastation from alcohol with the liver, 
but non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So this is really driven by our consumption of these added sugars where the liver can just literally start printing out fat lipogenesis. And also with its really incredible intelligence, it's always trying to figure out how to keep you alive and keep you safe. We've got this rampant blood sugar issue still. Your liver can start packaging things up and start printing out VLDL right. particles as well. So let's talk about that. This is increasing our risk of cardiovascular disease. Absolutely. So, right. So when the liver is not working properly, we're not really processing glucose effectively, it's going to be converted to VLDL or triglycerides. Um, and this is something, this is a part of our blood panel that we all need to zero in on more. Um, we may not always see VLDL on our on our blood panel, but um, triglycerides is something that we can look at that gives us right. a signal of this. And so, you know, your standard cholesterol panel is going to have total cholesterol, LDL cholesterol, HDL cholesterol, and triglycerides. And our doctors are always going to focus on that LDL cholesterol because this is um, this is the one that we have a medication for, right? We've got mm. statins. But if you actually look at the odds ratio of risk for cardiovascular disease, triglycerides, um, which is this pa repackaging of sugar to fat, um, actually has a higher um, is more correlated to heart disease even than uh, LDL. And this number, when I look at that number, if it's really above 100, I'm thinking that this person is probably, um, there's something going on metabolically that's a problem. Maybe there's too much added sugar or fine carbohydrates in the diet. It's really a signal to me of something going on with blood sugar um, and carbohydrates. And what's amazing about triglycerides is that it can drop so quickly when we clean up our diet, when we avoid the refined processed foods. I've seen patients actually drop their triglycerides 100 points in a month mm. from just cutting out refined sugars and refined carbohydrates. And that is just you know, a, a ticket to having better outcomes in terms of diabetes, obesity, uh, heart disease. So um, Something that's you know really a useful a useful thing to do is, is zero in on your triglycerides. It's gonna say on the lab slip that under 150 is normal or in the green, but really closer to 100 or less than 100 is where we want to be. So that's definitely an important um, an important lab test. And then of course on the flip side of that is HDL, which people call our our good cholesterol. We want that one higher. Um, and right now the average lab slip is going to say you want it somewhere above 40 or 50, depending on your gender. We really want that in the seventies, eighties, nineties. Um, so, you know, LDL important, but zeroing in on HDL and triglycerides can really actually give us, um, a, a better picture of our metabolic health. Absolutely. And this is something that's so within our control, especially when we're talking about triglycerides and, VL, just to map that out a little bit more, so we're talking about very low dense lipoprotein. So these, this the particle size. So this is more correlated with a, an increased incidence of maybe something getting stuck somewhere and creating a blockage. But at the end of the day, it's like, what is actually tearing up our circulatory system in the first place? It's sugar. Right. Triglycerides are a great marker for us to pay attention to. So this is really turning things on its head. And I just wanna dig a little bit deeper here because cardiovascular disease, contrary to popular belief, is still the number one cause of death in the United States overall. Right. And in this past year, in, in 2020, uh, well, now we're jumping into 2022, but in 2020, on average, we were seeing about 630,000 deaths from heart disease the last couple of years prior. It jumped up to almost 700,000. And you've heard barely heard a peep about it. And a big causative agent here if we're looking at, when we think about cardiovascular disease, I'm going off of what I was taught as well. We're looking at blood pressure, right? We're thinking about hypertension and we're not thinking as much about the blood sugar, right? But it's the same blood, you know, it's the same circulatory system that's handling all this stuff. And so could us t targeting and helping to m modulate and improve our blood sugar, could that help to dramatically reduce our risk and just these the number of people we're losing from heart disease? Oh, I mean, unquestionably, um, glycemic variability, which is the, the sort of fancy term for basically just big ups and downs swings in your blood sugar. So you're gonna, your blood sugar is changing all the time in relation to what you're eating and, and what you're doing. Um, again, it's a readout of many different things like your stress, sleep, exercise, food. When it goes up and down in big peaks and valleys, um, that's called increased glycemic variability. And that's an independent predictor of developing 
heart disease. And there's there's many reasons for this. Those big swings in glucose, like let's say you have you know, you just sit down and eat a whole bag of chips, which has like tons of, you know, easily accessible what carbohydrates. Kind of chips? <laughs> uh, you know, just like potato chips, basically. Okay, so just the regular Lay's. Yeah, or right. just really anything made with white flour or something that's going to have this easily accessible blood sugar. You're going to probably see that big spike in your blood sugar. And that is, you know, that's glycemic variability. That's going to set off a lot of different processes in the body, potentially five processes, all of which can contribute to heart disease. Um, the first is that that can cause inflammation. Yeah. Um, this, the body sees this big spike in blood sugar. It's like, what's going on? This is not normal. This is not our normal homeostatic baseline. It's a little bit of a threat signal to the body. So that big spike can cause inflammation. It can also cause glycation. Glycation is the process where sugar in the bloodstream, excess sugar, because there's so much floating around, it sticks to things in the body. It sticks to proteins. It sticks to fats. It sticks to um, you know cell membranes and causes dysfunction. You don't want sugar sticking to things, right? And so when the higher concentration of blood sugar is present, it's going to happen more and that causes cellular dysfunction. The third thing you can do is cause oxidative stress. This is uh, met, met, metabolic processes, um, when the body's sort of working harder metabolically, it's going to create um, metabolic byproducts that are actually reactive, free radicals, and mm. that that is called oxidative stress. So increased glucose can cause more of that, which we know is also one of the sort of pathophysiologic root causes of heart disease. And then the fourth thing it does, of course, is cause the body to release insulin. A big glucose spike is going to cause a big insulin spike. And typically, the insulin spikes are pretty proportional to how big the glucose spike is. And so that, again, is the hormone that's telling the body, get the sugar out of the bloodstream into the cells. Insulin is that you know key that unlocks that ability. And when we have that big insulin surge um, over time, like we talked about earlier, that's going to generate insulin resistance over time because the body sees so much insulin floating around. It's like being forced to drive so much glucose in the cells. The cells are like, whoa, stop. This is too much. And it actually puts a block on that signal. And the body's like, nope, we got to get that glucose into the bloodstream. So the pancreas, the organ that secretes insulin, starts pumping out more and more and more insulin to drive the sugar into the cells. But that whole ratcheting up process, that insulin resistance, that's really what drives us towards glucose instability. And insulin, aside from driving glucose in the cells, has many other effects in the body. So when it rises, that has an impact on things like heart disease, because one of its functions is like it's a pro-growth signal. It's a a signal that tells cells to kind of uh, to grow. It's anabolic, um, and one that one place it can do that is in the blood vessel walls. It can create you know endothelial blood vessel growth and dysfunction, kind of narrowing, and that of course can be related um, to heart disease. So so there are you know all these different things that happen just from blood sugar spikes that can lead to um, to heart disease. And yet, how often do we hear about blood sugar as a thing that can improve heart disease outcomes. Very rarely, we actually hear so much more about salt and how that can impact right. things. But, you know, in my opinion, um, one of the best things, absolutely best things we could do to reduce our heart disease risk is to get the blood sugar into a much more stable, sort of gentle rolling hills um, situation, not the big uh, peaks and valleys. And that's that's one of the reasons I'm a big proponent of monitoring your blood sugar um, is that if you can actually see how foods are affecting your blood sugar, see which foods are causing those big spikes for you, um, you know, therefore causing those big insulin surges, you can learn how to eat in a way that keeps your blood sugar in that stable uh, and more healthy, healthy range. Casey, this is the number one cause of death right. in our country, you know, and this is something we can do something about, but we've really been inundated, even with our very sophisticated level of technology and advancements we've made. You know, we're throwing drugs at the situation, statins, lisinopril, trying to target a symptom instead of like proactively, what are the basic things that our genes expect for us to have a healthy expression? And just to put the icing on the metaphor cake here, when we are experiencing this insulin resistance, which organ is taking the brunt of this abuse is gonna be your liver. Right. You know, trying to manage and figure this stuff out. It's even responsible uh, substantially for the breakdown of insulin as well. So, 
you know, this just compounds. Everything is existing within the same amazing body of ours, but we tend to compartmentalize things. And what's different about you, and this is what I want to ask you about next, is, and so I wanted, if you could share your background and how you got interested in health in the first place. What was little Casey running around like, you know, with a little stethoscope? And also, you know, through your education process, unlike for a lot of our friends and colleagues, we see that, you know, again, we're inundated with a certain way of thinking. You start to really pay attention to human nutrition mm. at some point. So let's start with little Casey. What got you interested in health? And let's talk about your background and what got you to where you are now. Yeah. Well, little Casey and adult Casey has always been completely in awe of the human body. It's one of the most beautiful complex systems in the universe. And I've always wanted to learn about and understand it. Um, when I went to Stanford for undergrad, I was so lucky because it was right in the middle of like the personalized genomics revolution. 23andMe was starting, the Human Genome Project was wrapping up. Um, and we were starting to really understand um, that more about our genome, but also that genes are not our destiny that so many of the environmental factors um, around us, like what we eat, what we put into our bodies, what we expose ourselves to, the environmental toxins we're surrounded by, our sleep, our stress, our exercise, that all of these things actually change the expression of our genome. They change the folding of our genome. It's incredible. Um, and that's something that's, you know, where we have agency. Something about thinking about genes as our destiny takes away agency, but when we learn the impact of the environment on them, we realize there's so much that we can do to get the outcomes we want. So I'm learning about this in, in undergrad, and and I, one of the things that was really awe-inspiring for me was the study of nutrigenomics, which is, which is the study of how food compounds, food chemicals go into our cells and actually change gene expression. So then I started thinking, God, you know, we put a couple pounds of food into our bodies every day. The average American eats one metric ton of food per year. That is all, you know, we, we call it food, but what is it really? It's molecular information. It's all just chemical compounds that we're putting into our body that both build our body, but also tell our body what to do. It's so cool. Um, and there's tens of thousands of chemicals in every piece of fruit that you eat. Um, and you know, what I kind of started to realize was that there are certain foods that do a lot of good for our genome and there's foods that don't. Um, and it's often, you know, like the beautiful plant foods that have all these little molecular compounds that go into our cells and do amazing things. Let's just talk about turmeric, for instance. You know, turmeric has uh, curcumin, a chemical compound in it that goes into our cells, changes the expression of the NF-kappa B pathway, which is one of our core inflammatory pathways in the body. It down-regulates the expression of pro-inflammatory genes through this food. That is power to know that because we know, of course, that inflammation is one of the root causes that links so many of our chronic illnesses, not to mention um, a baseline pro-inflammatory state is known to be associated with worse COVID outcomes. So we think about like, oh, there's foods that actually can downregulate this in our body. So flash forward <laughs> um, several years, I go to medical school um, and I... And then I go to residency and, and I, I trained, I did five years of training and uh, had a neck surgery, ear, nose and throat. Um, and something that really struck me, so I'm four years into medical school, a little over four years into my surgical residency. And I feel very far from that inspired college student that I was that was thinking about all the things we can do in our choices and our behaviors and our food choices to impact our health. Because what I'm seeing and what I'm noticing is that everything I'm doing as a clinician, as a surgical trainee is reactive. It's about doing stuff to the patient. It's about waiting until diseases and symptoms emerge and then swooping in and giving a drug. And if a does drug doesn't work, a surgery to sort of help manage what's going on. But I'm not doing anything in my practice. And I actually haven't really been trained in my medical training to think about what can the patient do? What can this individual do in their life to optimize their cellular biology, to maybe prevent us from getting to this place where they have to go to the operating room? Mm -hmm. And that was a real reckoning for me, sort of seeing how reactive the healthcare system is and also how much we really benefit and profit off of being um, reactive. You know, as uh, in, our, in our current uh, healthcare system, the way the incentives are set up is that we get paid for volume for seeing as many patients as possible, generating as many billing codes as possible, um, 
and doing things to the patient. You know, surgeries are very, very uh, lucrative. And, um, but, but built into that structure is to really wait for things to emerge and then react to them. And, you know, I just really realized that that's not the type of medicine that I want to be um, practicing. It's very paternalistic. It's reactive. It's not really empowering the patient to, um, to stay out of the doctor's office. Ultimately, for us to, you know, kind of fix healthcare, we need to fix health. And you can't fix health without fixing cellular biology. And the only real way we can fix cellular biology is by people making choices day in and day out that put the right conditions in the body to optimize health. And so, um, you know, practically speaking, I was I was in the hospital and I was I was treating all these conditions that were fundamentally rooted in inflammation. You think about things like what an, what does an ENT operate on? Sinusitis, laryngitis otitis, you know, thyroiditis. It's like all these itises, that suffix in medicine means inflammation. And not once, truly, was I trained or taught to talk about why is there inflammation? What is causing this inflammation? I sure knew how to reach for my prescription pad and prescribe steroids to tamp down that inflammation. I knew how to bust into a sinus or an ear and suck out pus, which is inflammatory infiltrate, you know, inflammatory um, goo essentially. But I did not know what was causing that inflammation. And that is a problem. If I went to Stanford undergrad, Stanford medical school, and I don't know why these people are getting inflammation, that's a problem. And that really started a journey for me where I feel like I kind of woke up and I started just asking why for everything. And one of the things I realized was, okay, you look at like sinusitis, for instance, and there's all these studies in the England Journal of Medicine that look at like the inflammatory cytokines that are in the nasal tissue that cause that inflammation that leads to sinusitis. It's things like interleukin-6 and TNF alpha, these inflammatory cytokines. Well, like, then step back and look at all the other chronic diseases we're dealing with in the country, obesity, diabetes, heart disease, Alzheimer's. The same inflammatory cytokines are upregulated in a lot of those diseases. And yet in our current medical system, there's 42 medical specialties. We're all focused on these little teeny parts of the body. I'm focused on these tiny little ear, nose, and throat, totally missing the forest of the trees on how there's a huge amount of connection going on between all these different systems. Um, and what that really woke me up to was more of um, sort of a systems biology approach to medicine. What are the things that are linking disease? Not just treating everything like separate things and separate silos where we play whack-a-mole medicine with each medical specialty. What is connecting things? And when you look at that level, there's just a handful of sort of core um, physiologic pathways that are leading to the majority of chronic disease we're seeing inflammation being one of them, metabolic dysfunction being another one of them. And so long story short, I thought, how do we attack at that level? How do we look at the connections between diseases and start really helping people figure this stuff out? Because when it comes down to it, the way to, to approach these core pathways is to help people figure out what decisions to make in their daily life that optimize their physiology. So that's how to eat, how to sleep, how to manage stress, how to exercise, how to optimize your microbiome. So it became really my life's work to figure out how to empower patients on the front end to make the decisions in their life that actually lead to better uh, physiology. And so totally left the surgical world and, um, and really focused on how to empower people with their own health information to make better decisions. And that's, of course, what led me to start my company, um, Levels, uh, with my amazing four co-founders, um, and to really focus more on a root cause approach to health um, that is patient-empowered um, and that is proactive. Oh, you're the best, by the way. <laughs> let, let me just say that first and foremost. You know, you got into the field to help people. And you just articulated so wonderfully, and we've heard this again and again from many of our friends and colleagues, that you know the way that things are constructed, it, it doesn't mean that you don't have a huge heart and a desire to serve. It's just we're lacking a certain skill set, and also the system itself that we're operating within. There's so many constraints. There's a standard of care, and also we're operating on volume and not quality, right. oftentimes, and we're coming in at the very end of things, instead of like, let's proactively make sure we don't even get to this place in the first place, which would overall, of course, save the healthcare industry, which is a $4 trillion business here in the United States, so much more money. 
and people are going lives are going to be saved yeah you know so it's just reframing things and so for you to have the audacity to look at things in my big passion well one of my big passions has been nutrigenomics nutrigenetics yes. for about 15 years just really looking at that from that lens like how can be an understanding you know we might have a you know i mentioned lisinopril earlier for you know um for for heart related issues cardiovascular issues that has we're talking about grams or micrograms of influence versus pounds of food like which one of these things is going to have the and not to say that the drug doesn't have its place but which thing is going to have the biggest effect and so starting to look through that lens but you mentioned levels which i have my levels on right now monitoring my blood sugar and it's just been so enlightening to and my also my wife has used levels as well and to be able to have this feedback and for you to really for me it's more of an affirmation because once you're really in tune with your body which ultimately that's what it is you're empowering folks to understand their body more not to become neurotic and find another thing to worry about but to pay attention to notice patterns and to optimize patterns for yourself so let's talk a little bit about levels and what it does and some of the information that it can give us. Sure, absolutely. So levels is a program that allows people access to this amazing little device, a biosensor called a continuous glucose monitor, which like you said, you wear on the back of your arm and it stays on the arm for two weeks and it's measuring in the background your blood sugar 24 hours a day, seven days a week, sending that information to your smartphone and letting you see in real time exactly how your food choices and your other lifestyle choices are affecting your blood sugar which we know is so important and in doing this it's really the first time ever that we've had closed loop biofeedback on what we're eating you know we've got that metric ton of food per year and we don't really know what it's doing to our body. If we go into the doctor's office and let's say our blood sugar is a little bit higher or our cholesterol is a little bit higher, they're gonna say, oh, you know, eat better, exercise more. Um, but what does that mean? Like, we, it really doesn't give us a lot of control or power in understanding things. And, um, you know, something, a stat that's really fascinated me is that 49% of Americans go on a diet each year. So there, 49% of Americans are trying to do better with their diet. And yet, as a country, we are just getting sicker. We are getting heavier. Our life expectancy is going down. Um, we're getting more depressed in the face of rising healthcare costs. So there is an effort outcome mismatch. And I think one of the big reasons that's the case is because we don't really know what the food we're eating is doing to our body. And unfortunately, we have to rely on generic recommendations from our doctors, or we follow you know, a nutritional ideology. And we've got, of course, these warring voices in the healthcare space about, or I'm sorry, in the nutrition space about what we should eat. There's the nutrition wars going on. So it's very confusing. And confusion makes people doubt their choices. And then we've got this rampant food marketing culture that can basically say anything they want on the boxes um you know without us really knowing what what the truth is and so in the face of that ecosystem having this kind of closed loop relationship where you can eat a specific food and know exactly how it's affecting your blood sugar this key metabolic biomarker in 10 minutes and maybe you've been dieting for 30 years and nothing's working you know and um and then you you eat your breakfast let's say you eat oatmeal with a little bit of blueberries and brown sugar and you see that your blood sugar goes up 80 points which would be a really really high rise you can say immediately in in one time of just checking this food with your continuous glucose monitor oh this food isn't working for me this food is likely causing a big insulin surge in me. And we know that one of the many functions of insulin is that it blocks fat burning in the body. We've talked a lot about insulin, but you know, aside from shuttling glucose into the cells and being an anabolic hormone, um, another thing that it does is signal to the body to not burn fat. It's a signal, oh, we've got tons of energy around in the form of glucose. Why would we tap into our fat stores? It blocks fat burning. So if you see that big spike with your with your oatmeal breakfast and you're trying to lose weight, you can immediately say, oh, this might not be the best breakfast for me for the goals that I have. And to be able to cut it. And oatmeal, of course, if you go into the store, it's going to say heart healthy. 
a great source of whole grains. Your doctor might say that it's, I mean, really go on any website that says what's a healthy breakfast. It's going to say oatmeal. But if it's causing an 8.80 point glucose spike for you, it is not a healthy breakfast for you. And that's, that's what I learned for myself, actually. You know, I, I had about a 75 to 80 point rise from just totally plain oatmeal. So no question, it's not a heart healthy food for me because glycemic variability, big spikes, independent risk factor for heart disease. I'm putting my body through this roller coaster, not to mention after a big spike like that, usually what you have is a crash, you know, because your body's released all that insulin, that huge insulin surge. It causes you to soak up all that glucose that just spiked. And often you can have a dip after that. And that's called reactive hypoglycemia after a big spike. And that's often when people feel that post-meal crash, that lethargy like an hour or two after a meal when they kind of need to take like a nap after lunch or after breakfast. That's often when you look at your your data right when you had that dip after a big spike. So if you can figure out how to actually stabilize that spike, make it more gentle, you're not going to have that crash. You're going to feel better throughout the day. And so, so I think the biggest thing is just really figuring out the personalized diet for you and being able to cut through just the super loud voices in food marketing, in the nutrition wars, and figure out what's right for your individual body. Um, And there was this amazing study that came out about five years ago in the journal Cell that was called Personalized Nutrition by Prediction of Glycemic Responses from the Weissman Institute in Israel. And what they did was they put, they took 800 non-diabetic healthy people They put continuous glucose monitors on all of them. Then they gave them standardized meals. So they all ate the exact same thing, same macronutrients, same calories, same everything. And what you'd probably think would happen based on our conventional understanding of blood sugar is that everyone's blood sugar would spike the exact same amount because they're all eating the exact same food. And if you think about things like the glycemic index chart, what that sort of tells us is that, oh, each food has an inherent property, an inherent quality of how much it will raise blood sugar. But the opposite happened. People were all across the board with the, these these similar with these same foods. So let's say they had these standardized cookies. Some people would have no glucose response to it. Other people would go up a hundred points in their glucose. And some people actually had equal and opposite reactions to different foods. So if you gave person A a banana and a cookie, they might spike to the banana and be flat to the cookie, and person B would be the opposite. And then they looked at what actually was determining those outcomes, and they came up with like over 100 factors in the body that might um, impact why people respond differently to different foods. Um, and one of the big ones is microbiome composition that we've already you know, touched on. Um, so this is, there, there's this personal, uh, personalization of diet that I think can be really, really powerful. And there may just be like landmines that we aren't aware of that are thwarting, thwarting our goals, whatever they are, weight, performance, avoidance of chronic disease with just a quick look at your data, you can kind of figure this out. And I think bigger picture, the thing you really nailed the word, word, it's about empowerment. You know, there's two different worlds we can live in. There's a world where you live your life based on what people tell you to do and what is normal. And you're kind of at the mercy of, of kind of that external input. Or there's a world in which you can trust your own body your own data, your own intuition, and make choices for yourself. And honestly, that's the world I want to live in. That's power. Um, I think a lot about patients who have to go into the doctor's office and kind of wait for the doctor to tell them what's going on with their own body. Each year, their doctor might say, oh, your, your blood sugar is two points higher than it was last year. Oh, it's two, five points higher than it was last year. One day, they're going to go into that doctor's office and a bomb's going to be dropped on them that you ha- now have prediabetes or you now have type 2 diabetes. When we have access to our own personal data day in and day out, not only can we figure out things like our diet, but we also can understand the trajectory of our health better. We own that process now. And the idea that someone could actually have that information and never go into the doctor's office and have this surprise bomb dropped on them, they go into the doctor and they say, oh, I know what my blood sugar is, and it's in a stable and healthy range. You're guaranteed to not have some bomb dropped on you. And that is so exciting to me. That really changes the relationship between um, patients and doctors. And it just it just really thrills me to think that patients could have more agency and empowerment in the face of this, unfortunately, several industries that 
in some ways benefit off us not having that information. Obviously, the food industry certainly, um, you know, benefits us off of, of us not really knowing what's how the food is affecting us. And then the healthcare system, you know, benefits from us, um, you know, not not being able to access this data ourselves, where they are in control of ordering the labs and you know prescribing the medications and what's whatnot. So it just really excites me to think about a population that has more information and can make these choices for themselves. Yes, and this is a great use of technology. You know, something that's empowering and. You know, I, I love that you you put emphasis when you said these words, when you were talking about the trial you ran, plain oatmeal, you said, this is the response for me, yeah. which it could be different for someone else. And this is what it's all about. Personalized nutrition is the thing I've been, prior to the Model Health Show being in existence, when I was, you know, in my, in my private practice, that was a thing that I was advocating. And I just thought it was obvious, but I gotta be honest, in the beginning, if I was into something, that's what the patient would be into. If I'm like vegan raw food, that's what you're gonna do because I think that this is the greatest thing ever. If I'm keto, that's what you're gonna do because I think it's the greatest thing ever. But thankfully, I kept an open mind and open heart and I could see, wait a minute, this thing is working great for this person or these people over here, but it's not working for these folks over here. What is it? You know, And just having that inquiry and starting to open my mind and understand that what we really need is nutrition that's right for us right now in this moment and understand that that is probably going to change. And so this this is where we start to get equipped with tools like this. And that that data and the study from the Wiseman Institute is so fascinating. I actually talked about it in my latest book, Eat Smarter, because it is so eye-opening and also empowering for us to understand, hey, We've got all these great diet frameworks and there's a lot of infighting taking place because everybody thinks that their diet framework is the end all be all. And that's the problem. You know, we're we're fighting about minutia at the top and missing on the fact that most people are consuming a load of processed foods. Mm. And that's really the issue we all need to be collectively working together on. Just getting folks back to eating real food and being able to pay attention to what's right for us right now. And right now, Levels is currently running a closed beta program. There's like 160,000 people on the wait list. And because this is exclusive with the Model Health Show, because you are a listener of the Model Health Show, you're going to get to jump the line and to utilize Levels. And again, this is exclusive for us. Go to levels.link forward slash model. That's L-E-V-E-L-S dot L-I-N-K forward slash model model and you get to jump the line you get to jump the line you get the vip you know you're rolling up to the club come right in you get to jump the line and to take advantage right now and be a part of this incredible beta process and the technology is already so wonderful i've gotten so much if folks can see on the video you could see a little you know i know my my sleeves are a little tight you know but you can see the levels and there's a great sticker to cover it up um so you could you know exercise shower all that stuff as well and I just want to, first of all, thank you for that and allowing us to be able to access this right now and to get this data. And so the next thing I want to ask you about is utilizing levels and the great data set you already have. You could see patterns. And again, this isn't about being neurotic or this is the end all be all answer, but you guys did get a great accumulation of information about what are some of the most problematic foods for folks as far as creating some disorientation with their blood sugar. So let's talk about what some of those foods were. Um, I know that you mentioned oatmeal. So was that one of those? We'll just give, a, if you can, the, maybe the top five foods that maybe even were surprising to be problematic for, for most folks. Yeah, absolutely. So um, one of the things that we see certainly across the board is that processed foods cause a large a large spike you know these ultra processed foods based in like refined grains and 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 flours and whatnot and sugars um and you know those are kind of we'd expect that um but we actually also see that there's a lot of foods that we typically consider to be healthy which actually cause a really large glucose spike so um, some of the ones in our data set that have been really high spikers are things like grapes, actually, um, sweet potatoes, oatmeal, um, corn, uh, funnily enough, acai bowls are one that get logged a lot that have a really big spike. So these are foods that have, you know, lots of nutrients in them. Of course, they're 
beautiful plant foods. But um, when eaten in isolation tend to cause a really big glucose spike. So that leads us to something else that we've really seen in the data set that when we balance meals and balance foods that um, have, you know, high carbohydrates, um, we actually see a, a much lower glucose response. So often adding fat, fiber, and protein to a carbohydrate actually causes a more gentle rise in glucose. It slows down digestion. Fiber actually may decrease the amount of total glucose you even absorb from the food. Protein also slows digestion. And so balancing foods um, and meals uh, with other macronutrients and not eating naked carbohydrates um, is something that's really helpful for a lot of people. The difference between an apple alone and an apple with a little bit of almond butter and maybe some chia seeds sprinkled on top is actually can be a really uh, big difference. And that's why I see, think we see something like grapes being such a high spiker. Grapes are something you often just sort of eat by the handful on their own. You're not really pairing it with um, a lot of other protein sources usually, or, or, or fat or fiber. And so we just see these really, really big um, rises. But another thing that we see that's really kind of interesting is how you can take kind of like a food category and see that there's quite a big spectrum in responses. So for instance, like sushi, uh, if people who just log sushi in the levels community tend to have quite a large glucose spike, like well over 30 milligram per deciliter rise after sushi. But people who log sashimi, you know, which is, of course, this fish without the rice, another thing you could order at a, at a Japanese restaurant, have a very low glucose response, less than 10 milligrams per deciliter. So maybe that kind of gives us the um, information of like, hmm, I'll order more sashimi and like less of the rolls with the rice. And then there's this whole new category of sushi that some people are doing, which is like cauliflower rice sushi, which actually tastes totally delicious. And I make it at home and I love it, which has virtually no glucose response, even though you're still getting like this, this, you know, these beautiful sushi rolls. And so it helps you kind of think through what am I going to order at a restaurant if my goal is to keep my glucose more stable, more flat. Similar with them, um, one that's really fascinated me is... Um, nutrition bars. So like you go into Whole Foods or Erewhon or whatever, and there's like a hundred different bars you can get, like Luna bars, Cliff bars, Bulletproof bars, Quest bars. There are so many. How do you choose? You know, you're just like, look, which box is prettiest, which has the best claims on it, whatever. Well, we can see in our data set just like a total spectrum from bars that have virtually no glucose response to bars that have like really high glucose response. In fact, I won't name names right now, but like some of the healthy, you know, nutrition bars that are in sort of like a nice brown paper wrapper that look like you should take it camping or something like that have a much higher glucose response than a Snickers bar. And then there's other bars like the Bulletproof bar, Quest bar, uh, Perfect Keto bars that have virtually no glucose response. So what I get so excited about is thinking that the future of nutrition is going to be people being able to make these choices in the grocery store based on data not based on food marketing, not being at the whim of these industries who want us to buy this food, but actually making a decision based on data, not only their own data, like the biofeedback loop they've had by testing something and seeing what worked for them, but on population data. What what was the response to this over, over 10,000 people, over a million people? We have 51 million glucose data points in our data sets, 1.5 million food logs that have been logged. The power of people being able to tap into what's happening on a population level, these foods, I think that's going to be the future of nutrition. I think in five years, it's going to seem very like quaint and outdated to choose your foods not based on objective biometric data that has been tested both in you and in a large population. You can imagine, you know, right now we go on to a, we Google some recipe we want to cook for dinner and a million recipes pop up. And we usually pick by like, how many stars does the reviews have? And like, does this have any ingredients I don't want to eat? But it we're, we're just a couple years probably away, maybe less from the time when there's actually going to be another section there that says this is how the population responded to it in terms of glucose rise. And then you can test it for yourself and find your own data about that. And that to me is power. That to me puts the hands in the population, uh, puts the power in the hands of the population and totally out of the power of the food industry. And I think it's going to open up radical transparency that's going to be demanded mm. by people for both the healthcare and the food system saying, don't try and just sell this to me like with marketing claims, because 
essentially marketing is going to become obsolete because the marketing is going to come from within from how we respond to it. And so that really excites me. And I, I think when I look at like, I scan the data set of like what's happening with just you know, nutrition bars or or brands of um, non-dairy milk, you see a big spectrum of what is causing a glucose spike and what's not. And that is already driving a lot of the decisions of people in our uh, community, which I think is exciting. And the, the last one I'll mention is that breakfast foods have been a massive thing. I think I've seen interesting data in our data set, which is that If you look at our best scoring foods, so when I say best scoring foods, I mean foods that had the most minor glucose response, very flat and stable response versus the worst scoring foods, which have big spikes and dips. Across breakfast, there are like clear breakfasts that are not working for people's blood sugar and clear ones that are. So when you look at what's in the worst, the big spiking category, it is waffles, pancakes, bagels, donuts, pastries. It's all these white beige you know, flour rich, sugar rich foods, which if you walk into a coffee shop, like that's what you're going to see behind the counter. We have normalized that these are breakfast foods. Cereal is another big one. Cheerios actually specifically um, is one that has a huge glucose response. Um, So for me, like those are just kind of off, off the table now. Um, When you look at the best scoring foods, it's things like eggs and avocado, eggs and greens, Actually, the Fab Four smoothie, which is a smoothie that was popularized um, by Kelly Levesque, an amazing nutritionist, um, which is basically a smoothie that's a mix of greens, proteins, fat, fiber, minimal sugar, very good score. Um, frittata has a minimal score. I'm thinking about other things in the data set. A chia seed pudding. Um very minimal glucose response. So it's not like it's just animal rich foods. It's also some of these plant-based foods like a like a green smoothie, um, a specific type of green smoothie um, that's well balanced and chia pudding. So I look at all this and I'm like, great. If I'm trying to lose weight, if I'm trying to keep my blood sugar down, if I'm trying to improve my risk of chronic disease, I'm not eating these things, even though they're covering the grocery store even though a lot of the foods in these foods are subsidized by our government, so it's normalized that they're okay, not eating them. But I am going to eat eggs and avocado, eggs and greens, chia pudding, Fab Four smoothie, frittata, et cetera. And so um, that's kind of some of the stuff we're learning about food in the data set. I could could go on and on, but it's just, it's a whole new world of how we're going to judge food um, and nutrition. Yeah, this is so powerful. This is taking it from, you know, again, there's still a level of theory when we see a bagel that, you know, I know that this is really high in refined carbohydrates and, you know, added this and that, you know, same thing with the pancake. Um, But it's still a theory that this food is bad for me. Now you can see yourself what it's doing to your body. And again, this doesn't, we don't want to get to a place where folks are being erotic or that this is the end all be all. And also, of course, this is individual, regardless of any of the foods that you just mentioned. But just being able to get a beat on things, because I think that ultimately what we want folks to be able to do, because we already know that, that, you know, that waffle is probably not the best thing for you. But now we can start to listen to our bodies, you know, get to a place where we can listen to our bodies. And if we have the waffle, no, we want to get to a place really. And this is what I think the greatest gift is with levels is getting your body to a place where there's a healthy metabolic range that your body's staying in with your blood sugar it's 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 managing things very well you're in a good state of health and so that when you do have the waffle it's not just totally messing you up like your body can kind of clean house get things back to baseline with with some grace you know and so i think that that's one of the great gifts and also you mentioned you know some of these foods that tend to be some of the the biggest influences of derangement potentially again from all your data sets and I love that you mentioned this. So it's not that the oatmeal is going to be, because I know some folks are like, not my oatmeal. You'll never take it from me. You know, whereas like, what if we have the oatmeal and you add some protein along with it, or you have the oatmeal and you add some almond butter, mix that in there, or you've got, I'm, I love acai bowls. Like I'm super into that just the last couple of months. You know, we went to, I took my family to Huntington Beach for a little staycation mm. uh, over the summer and we got some acai bowls and I was like, I could do this better, you know? And so I was, so now I blend the acai with protein yes. immediately. So I'm blended with protein, some nut butter, you know, bring down that that glycemic spike. And now also with levels, I can track this and see it firsthand. And, um, you know, it's just such a wonderful thing. And also with grapes, these are foods that we tend to eat in isolation, as you mentioned. 
So let's take that out of that context. Unless it's unless your body does well with it, which is cool, we got to understand even the grapes that we're eating, they're not the same grapes that are in the, you know, the the historical references, you know. There would be seeds there, you know. And so you would also have to slow down or you're chomping through some seeds. We could just pile on a bunch of grapes really quickly. And what if we take those grapes, if you still want to get dabble in some grapes and cut them up, throw them into, a, you know, a summer salad or yes. something like that, you know. So just getting this data and being able to become more intelligent in our choices and creative and expansive. I don't think this closes a door on things. I really think it opens the door for much more. I think you brought up such an important point, which is this is not about restriction or elimination necessarily. This is about awareness. This is about informed choices. This is not about never eating a waffle again, but it may mean that, oh, I'm going to try, you know, Birchbender's keto almond flour waffles instead and see how that works for me. Or I'm going to eat the same, same waffle, but I am going to do some things around it that make it work better for my body, like add almond butter on top of it, add chia seeds, take a walk after the meal. Just a simple 15-minute walk after eating a high-carb meal can have a significant impact on lowering your blood sugar from that meal. Because again, you're soaking up that glucose out of the bloodstream into the muscles for use. And the really cool thing about muscle is that Unlike almost every other tissue in the body, muscle can take up glucose without the action of insulin. Just the muscle contraction alone can can allow for glucose to be taken out of the bloodstream. So it's like a freebie. Like use it, use that, you use those big muscle groups, and even a two minute walk every half an hour throughout the day can statistically significantly decrease your 24 hour glucose levels compared to people who are more sedentary throughout the day. So this is like, just use those muscle groups, do a few squats after your waffle, whatever. And there's so many other things you can do. You could take, for instance, an apple cider vinegar shot before your waffle. We know that vinegar actually um, tends to have an effect of lowering our glucose levels. Um, You could preload your meal with some vegetables, you know, have a little I don't know. It'd be weird to have a salad before breakfast, but not really in our, I think in our world, I, I'd be happy to do that, but put something in the stomach before eating the carbs. So what I'm trying to say here is that there is this whole context around these foods that you can do mm. to um, enjoy that food um, and have less of a, gl- a glucose um, spike. And so it's uh, it, there's just like a whole toolbox we have to basically minimize that um that response. So it's not it's not so much about restriction as it is about context, about awareness. And 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 you know, I, I would say personally in my own life, um, I I really think about sleep and stress as well when I'm choosing what foods to eat. If I have had a poor night's sleep, um, I, I typically wear a whoop strap and we actually did a small pilot with whoop, um, which is one of the wearables that tells you about sleep and activity, um, that showed that the whoop uh recovery score, which is a marker of your sleep quality, your resting heart rate, your heart rate variability, and your respiratory rate, that actually correlated with your glucose variability the next day. Um, And so if my sleep is poor for whatever reason, you know, I've stayed up late working or whatnot, I know that I'm going to try and be a little bit more cognizant of what types of carbohydrates I need in the next day, because I'm probably going to have more of an erratic response to the same food after a poor night of sleep. So um, same with, with if I was quite sedentary the day before. The next day, I'm probably going to avoid the higher carb, higher spiking foods for me because I know I'm going to basically have a worse impact. So just setting up that whole context around what you're eating, it makes it really fun, you know? And it's, it's again, like you said, it's not about restriction. It's about um, pairing things really thoughtfully to create the best metabolic sort of impact for our, for our body. And um, it's also not about just like trying to game the system with, you know, super low carb foods or low carb bars to keep our glucose flat. You know, you could, you could chug canola oil and your glucose would stay flat. That doesn't mean it's healthy. It's about holistically building a healthy body that processes energy effectively. That is the goal. And that is what our program and our app is really trying to drive people to do by taking in other data streams as well. We take in sleep data, we take in step and heart rate data so that people can build this holistic uh, context. And I think the future is really exciting because right now, the only continuous biomarker that we can track is glucose. That's the only sensor that's available for for use. Um, 
But in the future, like what if we can check inflammatory markers? What if we can check um, byproducts of fructose metabolism in the bloodstream? We can see a more holistic picture of what food's doing to our body. And I think that is really the future is more continuous biomarkers that let us make these decisions in our lives for, for optimal health. Mm, this is great. This is it's such a great segue because I was going to ask you about outside of food, which food is kind of that tangible thing. Like we can see the food, we eat the food, we have a relationship with it, but we don't think about the metabolic implications of stress mm. because it's invisible in a sense. You know, it's you can't really touch it. You can't, you know, you can't eat it. You can kind of stress eat, but you, you're not eating stress in a sense. Sleep deprivation, same thing. And for me, in looking at my data, you know, there was one particular day that I was dealing with a, again, a random s stressful thing. And this was the one day that my blood sugar was bonkers. Like it was stress. It wasn't, you know, a matter of fact, I was uh, intermittent fasting mm. and the stress thing happened and my blood sugar went up significantly. I'm just like, what the? But then again, if I'm listening to my body, I already knew. That's why I checked it at that time. It's just like these catecholamines that I'm producing, you know, these stress hormones, they might be like letting my body know like, hey, there's a stressful event coming, fight or flight scenario, because our biology, even though we, we believe we're so evolved, we're still very, we have very prim primitive uh, outpicturing and processing. And so this fight or flight feeling that I'm getting, it's getting my body prepared. It's like, hey, he's got some stuff stored in these muscles here, some some glucose. Let me go and unlock that, put that in his bloodstream because he might need to roll out, you know? And so like to get to see that firsthand, I was just like, wow, that is so nuts. And so, but here's the thing, even with that, I'm still empowered. I don't have to be a victim to this stress. And also stress isn't bad. It's gonna happen in our lives, but I have tools to reframe things even in that moment or to take some breaths mm. you know to to just tickle the parasympathetic nervous system a little bit in that moment you know versus just like the sympathetic dominance taking over we are so powerful like we just kind of again outsource our biology to the external world when all of this is within us mm. you know so let's talk about you you mentioned sleep deprivation being one of those things Let's talk about stress in the context of our blood sugar. Yeah, stress is a really profound um, variable in what our glucose levels are doing during the day. And, and something I really tell patients and that I, I, I think is important to know is that you could have like the perfect metabolic diet. You know, everything's totally dialed in. But if you're not managing your stress, you are not gonna be optimally metabolically healthy. Food is necessary, but not sufficient for optimal metabolic health. Again, we are a whole complex system. You know, this is not like, you know, everything's separate. Stress, sleep, uh, um, food, exercise, these things all weave together in this incredible hormonal, you know, chemical milieu that leads to the outcome. So you've got to think about each of them and how they relate to each other. So with stress, you really nailed it. I love how you put it. Like it's telling the body, like we might need to roll out. And so we need some energy available to feed these muscles. So our liver stores um, a few hours worth of really quickly accessible glucose for energy for emergencies like that. Um, it's in this in storage form called glycogen. And when your stress hormones release, catecholamines, cortisol, it goes to the liver and it tells the liver, dump that stored glucose, break that glycogen down, put it into the bloodstream so that our muscles have a quick source of energy for uh, mobility. And that's an evolutionarily advantageous thing. If you're being chased by a lion, you want that glucose to dump so that you can use your muscles. Unfortunately, though, in our current world, we are under chronic low-grade stress basically all the time. The text dinging going off, the honking, you know, the, the emails we're getting constantly the body doesn't really realize that this is not a lion chasing you. It's the same threat signal. We're not safe. And it's happening all the time, not to mention biologic forms of stress, the toxins in our food, water, and air, even being sedentary is kind of a form of stress for the body. So it's like, it's coming at us from all angles and we're constantly just like 
you know, like you said, hitting that sympathetic nervous system button. And so that can kind of create a situation in which we're just constantly keeping the blood sugar like a little bit elevated. I have noticed myself the very first podcast I did a few years ago, I was really nervous and I looked at my blood sugar afterwards and I had gone, I was totally fasted. I went up like 40 points. Like it looked like a food spike because of that cortisol, catecholamines, liver dumping, et cetera. And so we want to do whatever we can to, to avoid that. And the beauty is there's so much that we can do about it. We can, as you said, tickle the parasympathetic nervous system. And we can do that with tried and true practices like breath work. So to me, I'm really using my glucose monitor as a mindfulness biofeedback tool now. And when I see or feel that I'm under stress, I will just immediately go towards that deep diaphragmatic breath, you know, whether it's a a deep four breath inhale, four breath exhale, or a two to one ratio of inhale to exhale, do 10 deep breaths. I can feel my body change immediately in terms of how I just subjectively feel. Um, It's that beautiful release of calm. Um, But I also know that it's doing something good for my blood sugar because what it's doing is it's translating to my body that I'm safe. It's changing the hormonal milieu in my body saying, you're safe, there's not a threat. We don't need to mobilize energy for your muscles. You can simmer down. And so so that's been something really super powerful for me about um, the link between blood sugar and stress. And of course, it all comes back to um, some of these ancient practices like breath um, and just getting ourselves and our body into a state of realizing that it's okay. Yeah, you even shared with me before we got started that even proactively doing this before you eat your meal can improve your body's response to said food afterwards. And if you think about, well, first of all, can you share a little bit about that? And then I'll share an example that it reminds me of. Yes, absolutely. So there have actually been research that's shown that in people with type 2 diabetes, just mindful eating, so really getting centered and sitting down and relaxing and taking a few, t- taking a few deep breaths and taking a moment to look at your food, appreciate the food, have gratitude for the food, look at the colors, the smells, the textures, um, of, of what's in front of you just for a couple of minutes can actually significantly reduce the glycemic impact of that meal compared to if you just plow into that meal essentially mindlessly, which is how I think many of us eat a lot of the time, eating on the go, um, you know, shoveling food in our mouths while we're eating. I think about surgical residency when I was like, I don't think I had a single meal sitting down for like four and a half years. Like I was on the staircase, like eating food in between surgeries, just shoving the cortisol was high, my body was not in a rest and digest state, and I'm sure it had um, an increased uh, impact on what the glucose was doing. And so um, so that's a definite thing I would recommend to people is that it's not just you know fuzzy advice to say mindfully eat. There's a real impact on what's going on with our hormones and the way we're digesting food. And so if you can just sit and maybe practically speaking, take um, 10 deep breaths into your belly, take a moment to express gratitude for the food and then eat. It can actually have a a significant impact on how you, how your blood sugar raises in response to that meal. Yeah. And if you think about just this, this concept of taking a moment to pray before you eat, for Mm -hmm. example, that folks have been doing for centuries, you know, that's kind of like calming down, getting centered, going within and allowing for the the parasympathetic door to open because it's really a binary system by the way you can't do both at the same time and you know i think that a big reason as you just mentioned you said plowing through which is a great term is like we're just you know because of our constant fluctuations in our blood sugar when food is around it's just time like let's go for it instead of just and i know i've had those moments as well but i still every time i eat i take a moment Even if I'm in the middle of a restaurant, you know, I close my eyes, just take a moment, I give thanks for the food and take a couple of deep breaths and just become centered. It's just like the channel gets changed in reality for me and suddenly the food is here. Like it's just like a a, a completely different experience because I just want to plow into that food, you know, especially if you're hungry. And that's another thing, getting ourselves to the point where we're really like, we're quote starving, which we're not starving. then it's going to increase the incidence where we don't take a moment just to just to stop because we tend to think like this food is in front of us it's the last meal 
you got to go for it. And, you know, so this provides, again, more empowerment for us. And also it brings us back to more humanity because we have something going on today that we didn't have before, which is even while we're eating, our minds are getting outsourced. We're not, it's not like we're having the meal and like in a parasympathetic around good friends, having conversation or just being there present with our foods. We're probably working. As you mentioned, being in the staircase, my, my wife shared the story. She actually told me yesterday, she was like, babe, did I tell you what I used to eat for lunch when she was in high school? Multiple times a week, I think she said like every day, which is scary. But then she, again, she had her mom cooking these incredible Kenyan meals for dinner. Mm. But she said every day she had a Rice Krispie treat and a Snickers bar for lunch and eat it in the staircase, right? Because, you know, she was coming from Kenya. She's feeling, you know, like she wasn't fitting in. And I'm just like, bro, how did you how did you survive? But then again, you know, it's just it's going to get balanced out somehow. And, you know, I think that if we can reel it back in a little bit and it's not it's not that you can't, you know, have a movie night and eat your dinner or whatever. But if that becomes the norm where your your mind is somewhere else than with your food or with what's happening in reality right there it's probably not going to have a good outpicturing for our body's response. And so, you know, I love this so much. And, you know, one of the other things that I want to ask you about is, and this brings to light something so powerful. I've been talking about this for years, like literally since the first year of the Model Health Show, because we still can get tunnel vision when it comes to food and think that this is everything, which I know that I'm guilty of that because I'm a nutritionist. So food to me was everything. This is the end all be all. But in reality, you can overeat your way into creating excessive fat. You can under exercise or under move your way into excessive fat. You can under sleep your way into excessive fat. And you can also over stress your way mm. into excessive fat. And levels helps you to see that firsthand that your blood sugar can go nuts just when you're stressed. And if you're chronically in that state, which a, we're talking hundreds of millions of people are living in perpetual stress and anxiety. It's no wonder we're in this place that we are. It's not just about the food. The food is a major portion of it for sure. But this is bringing to light how stress and anxiety is such an issue. And so the thing that I want to ask you about, and it's going to all tie together, and especially for our time that we're living in right now and talk about solutions, the CDC's report, I've mentioned this several times. I'm going to keep hammering this away till we get it because something just happened this week that we talked about right before the show, reiterating this point, but they analyzed the data from 540,000 plus COVID-19 patients, over 800 US hospitals. The number one risk factor for death from COVID was obesity. This was back in July, 2021. Everybody could see it, published article. And the second leading cause of death was anxiety and fear related disorders, the second leading risk factor for death. Third risk factor was diabetes and its complications, right? So the first and third is something like, oh, of course, or we're not doing anything about it, but of course, but that middle one, the stress component is literally killing people. And I just read a paper this morning looking at an anti-psychotic uh, medication, an anti-anxiety medication, mm -hmm. reducing the risk of death from COVID. And I'm just like, what the hell? Why, why are people not talking about this? Because anxiety, that anxiety is going to exacerbate your immune system is gonna cause more dysfunction. We know about this. We have entire fields of psychoneuroimmunology, years of data, we know this stuff. And so this is what I wanna ask you about. We, you mentioned this, that a new report just came out this week, finally saying, hey, you know, being excessively overweight is going to lead to worse outcomes from COVID and losing weight can possibly help to mitigate those things. Yeah. It's just like, we've been talking about this for a long time now, but, with that said, obesity is arguably the biggest risk factor for these chronic conditions as well. And as you mentioned, abnormal blood sugar ties in very neatly with that. So let's talk about this. How can we address our obesity epidemic? Because right now we're knocking on the door of about 250 million of our citizens being overweight or obese. And this is tied to over 400,000 deaths a year at least this is looking at, again, just the major things, diabetes, heart disease, not to mention all the other stuff. So what can we do in this scenario? Because our blood sugar, as you mentioned, it's leading to worse outcomes with infectious diseases as well as chronic diseases. 
What do you want to see happen? What can we do to get our citizens healthier? Mm. You brought up so many, so many great points in what you just said. And I think the first is the concept of fear, which I'll just touch on briefly. I think one thing that people might not realize is that there's just such an incredible bi-directional relationship between metabolic health and mental health. Um, actually, people with metabolic dysfunction and blood sugar dysregulation have about twice the rates of depression and anxiety as people without it. And of course, when there's more fear and anxiety, it's going to drive that high cortisol and catecholamine state that leads us to be more metabolically dysfunctional. So they're very, very tied in to each other. And fear um, and sense of threat in the body, in the mind, of course, is going to mobilize this inflammatory sort of cascade in the body that says, there's an issue, there's a threat. We need to mobilize our resources like our immune system, which is the part of the body that fights threats. So we're living in this state where we're just creating the physiology in the body in part by how we're thinking um, that sets us up for dysfunction. Um, And concurrently, that dysfunction is contributing biologically to what's going on in our minds. So it's just an incredible bidirectional relationship that I think most people are not aware of. If you ask the average person, with depression and anxiety, are you tracking your blood sugar? Do you know where you stand on the metabolic health spectrum? I think the majority are going to say no, even though there's a strong both epidemiologic and mechanistic link linking the two. So then moving into the question of, of COVID and what, we, what I'd like to, to see happen, I think you've touched on this so much in the show, and I think it's in, your, in many episodes, and I think it's so important is that we need to be talking at the highest level of public health about how important it is to optimize our metabolic health um, and our weight in order to make ourselves biologically resilient to face this virus. The data is so clear. I actually published a paper in the journal Metabolism, um, sole author paper, about this was in, I submitted this in April of 2020. This was over a year and a half ago. It was published in print in June. I had basically just been reviewing the research up and that started basically in February of last year about what was going on with COVID. And it was becoming clear that there are several biologic mechanisms that were leading to worse outcomes in people with type 2 diabetes or metabolic dysfunction, conditions like obesity. And we even knew then that it was not just a um, correlation, but there were potentially causative mechanistic links of why people were doing worse. Now, which we're, we're seeing a lot more, which is great, but for instance, obesity and diabetes create a baseline pro inflammatory state in the body. People with these conditions have elevated immune chemicals like cytokines already in circulation. And we know that then when the virus affects the body, it mounts even more of an immune response. And we get this cytokine storm that actually leads to the organ damage. It's the body's response to the virus, this overwhelming response um, that can cause the organ organ damage that leads to um, such severe morbidity and mortality. So if you're at baseline in that pro-inflammatory state with elevated cytokines like interleukin-6 and TNF-alpha, then when the virus hits you, you're going to mount that exaggerated response that hits your organs. And this circles all the way back to like what we were talking about with curcumin and turmeric and NF-kappa B pathways. You know, there are foods, I'm not certainly not saying that turmeric is going to prevent us from from having poor COVID outcomes at all. There's no research to suggest that. But just the fact that what we're eating has a direct impact on these inflammatory pathways, on the levels of cytokines in our bodies that we know are related to outcomes. So that was one of the the things that was a mechanistic link is increased baseline pro-inflammatory state in the body in the setting of metabolic disease. The second is that high blood sugar on its own can cause immune cell dysfunction. Um, Basically for an immune cell to work and to do its job, it has to get to the site of infection in the body. It literally has to move through the bloodstream, out of the bloodstream, into the tissue and fight the infection and the cells that are infected. And that's a process called um, chemotaxis, which is the cells moving to the site of infection and phagocytosis, which is actually eating cells that are infected or eating, you know, viral particles, whatnot. And high blood sugar can directly impair the cell's ability to both move and phagocytose um, uh, in, you know, infection. And so we're literally stunting the ability of our immune cells to do their job just by having elevated blood sugar. The opportunity here is, is massive. You know, 
figure out how to keep our blood sugar under better control. And we know that it's going to have positive impacts um, on on the body. And there's several other, you know, things that have come out, of course, like that in the setting of diabetes, the um, the ACE2 receptor, which may be one of the sites of entry of the virus, is upregulated. So you've got more of these receptors on the cell membranes, maybe makes it easier for viral uh, entry into the cells. We also know that people with diabetes had um, higher sugar in their lung fluid. So like the sugar's everywhere, right? It, it's going to go. E- and that, um, that uh, higher levels of glucose sort of even in the lung tissue may have been a uh, part of what made um, you know, the lung tissue so affected uh, by the virus in people with diabetes. So all of this I went into in this paper a year and a half ago. And yet, and, and really the call to action was, um, we can talk all we want about masks. We can talk all we want about Clorox. We were talking at that point about like uh, cytokine inhibitors to help stunt the cyto- cytokine response. But none of that, those are all reactive measures. None of those increase biologic resilience. And one of the things that can is getting our metabolic health under control, which has all these multifarious effects on our immune system and how we're going to show up in the face of this um, virus. Not to mention, it's not just about creating readiness and resilience in the face of COVID. Every single flu season, people with type 2 diabetes or metabolic dysfunction have about a five time higher rate of hospitalization mortality from these respiratory illnesses. So it's not just about this one virus. This is about in the face of any infectious um, agent. We want to be resilient. And so certainly um, I think that every billboard in the country should just have five steps of how to stabilize your blood sugar. It's not that hard. And what we know is that even for people with full-fledged type 2 diabetes, you can in many cases, reverse that condition or improve the condition. That's not something we hear a lot. When I was in medical school, I definitely thought type 2 diabetes was irreversible. That is not true. And for those 80 million people with prediabetes, it's even more likely that you can you know, reverse the disease. Um, and so... Uh, so I just think that, you know, we should be talking about this nonstop. You know, what if the billboards out there or the front page of the New York Times every day said, hey, um, balance your meals, walk after meals, get good sleep, uh, take deep breaths when you're stressed, things that can actually improve blood sugar. You know, that's what I would I would love to see there. There's, you know, many other facets of it, of course, of course. But the baseline is what we just need to be talking about yeah. this and what the data shows. Um and fortunately, there's people like you um, who are out there beating this drum constantly, and I think it's making a huge impact. Yeah, thank you so much, and that's incredibly powerful. And again, the goal here is to be empowered and giving folks things that this moves away from fear, you know, because it's giving you things proactively. And here's the thing: again, we have literally thousands upon thousands of peer-reviewed papers on the efficacy of all these things, of movement and the relationship with your immune system, with your mental health, the list goes on and on, with nutrition, with sleep. We know that these things work, but suddenly they've been just kind of silenced. None of these things matter. And instead, do all these superficial things and missing the point, even if we're trying to drug our way out of another situation, which we've not been successful doing this in the past, if you just look at the trajectory of our biggest killers, but we're still missing the point on if your metabolic health is not up to par, you're not going to mount an appropriate immune response suddenly because you take a new drug. It just doesn't work like that. We're missing the point. We're leaving people to be disadvantaged instead of helping people to be empowered. And how do we get there? Again, we are now at the two-year mark of COVID becoming a part of our lexicon. And just about two months here in the United States, it landing and you know starting to take over not just being a part of our lexicon but just a part of our day-to-day lives so two years and within that two years we literally could have revolutionized the health of our citizens i've seen what how how quickly things can be mobilized again this is two years into it just last week no no it was this week i was driving home from the gym and three different places in my 12-minute drive lines were wrapped around the block for COVID testing. Around the block, three different places, people are standing in line with their mask on, waiting to get their test. 
And again, if people can get out in the middle of the day and go and do that, they can get out and go and go for a walk or whatever mm -hmm. the case might be. But the motivation has to be there from the authority figures who are telling them what to do. Because truly, people could have been checking in on their grandma, just like, grandma, did you get your 10 minute walk in today? You know that this is, it's, we gotta protect you from COVID. We've got data, we're here in, in LA, Kaiser Permanente is not that far from my house. I, the paper, again, this is back 2020, looking at the data, I believe it's 50,000 folks that they analyze their data. They found very clearly, and again, but this is observational data, but they did a great job of adjusting for confounding factors. Folks who didn't, you know, they had a category of folks who were active and the folks who were inactive. The folks who were regularly inactive had almost a three times higher risk of dying from COVID. You know, and again, it's not that, it's because we tend to, tend to put these things into camp. So you're gonna exercise your way out of COVID. No, we're talking about becoming more biologically resilient, mm. which defends you from everything in some context. And again, it puts the power back into your hand mm. to be a stronger human being, to feel better, your mental health. It starts stacking conditions in your mm. favor. That's really what it's about. Instead of giving this one trick pony as if it's gonna work. And again, if you just look at the order of things, you know, we haven't been driving things in the right direction, but we can change that. Mm. And you are one of those people that I'm so grateful for you and for your work and for the the audacity that you've had to like, you know what? This is where things really work. And this is where we're going to empower people. This is where we're going to provide, you know, r real proven strategies for things to get folks to a good state of health. And if you can, can you let folks know where they could follow you? get more information, just get more into Dr. Casey Means world. And also I'll throw it back as well to the link for levels. Again, this is very, very exclusive for us. You get to jump in front of this wait list, go to levels.link for slash model. So that's L E V E L S dot L I N K forward slash M O D E L. Casey, where can folks find more information? Well, people can find me on Instagram and Twitter at Dr. Casey's Kitchen, Dr. Casey's Kitchen. Um, you can find Levels at Levels on Instagram and Twitter, and really fun to follow Levels. Uh, I think on Instagram, especially because so many of our beta customers, our beta members, are doing all these experiments, like we've been talking about today, walking after meals, pairing their apples with almond butter, um, seeing how different types of exercise affect their health, and showing it. And it's it. it even if you don't have a monitor on, you can still learn from these strategies that people are, are doing. You know, you don't need to have uh, the sensor to be able to take advantage of a lot of these pearls that we've talked about and that other people are sharing. So that's on Instagram and Twitter. On the web, we're at www.levelshealth.com. And I highly recommend levelshealth.com slash blog. Um, our blog is a huge investment that we've made at the company to bring in the key thought leaders um, in metabolic health uh, to talk about a lot of the topics we've been talking about today and actionable, you know, practical tips that people can use to improve their metabolic health, again, with or without a sensor on. Um, and so that's a great resource. Um, and and yeah, and then get on our, uh, you can sign up for our newsletter on the website as well. And we send out some really high quality information about um, how to empower yourself to have the agency in your life to improve and optimize your metabolic health. What if I told you these are diseases of skeletal muscle first? And that obesity, diabetes, heart disease, cardiovascular disease begin in skeletal muscle first. Insulin resistance begins in skeletal muscle first. And if we care about root cause medicine, then we have to care about skeletal muscle.